Okay, so Genesee County Animal Control is uh, like everybody else on this report here. And um, if you take a look at the open admission shelters, you'll see that out of 53 shelters in the state of Michigan, Genesee County ranks 49 and has a save rate for 2013 of 31.27%. And if you are close to Genesee County and know about uh, the way they do business and how they handle their reporting, you know that that's probably a lie. It's probably worse than that. So it's a bad place. It's been a bad place for a long time. And um, in 2011, uh, myself and, and several other individuals formed a group called Grace. Uh, because we thought we've got to do something about this and there had been groups before us trying to make change in Genesee County um, but I think the problem that they ran into is uh, they all tried to do too much they all tried to go into the shelter and, and uh, volunteer and foster animals and do adoptions and um, once you're in that environment you just don't know what to do first and then you find yourself in a position where um, if you speak out or if you're too critical or if you challenge too much, you might get banned from the shelter or uh, there might be some retaliation killing, which actually happens. Uh, and so they, they found themselves kind of handcuffed and not able to get anywhere. So Grace came along in August of 2011 and we were super naive. I mean, we followed it kind of in the same footsteps as you. Uh, in that we thought, gosh, if people know better, they'll do better. We have all these, we have all the answers. We know where the good shelters are run. We know what the best practices are. We just need to tell people. And we felt like if we did it in a way that was not emotional and that was very professional and, um, you know, we're, we're smart, capable people, we should be able to do this. And so for the first year, we kind of banged our head against the wall, trying to talk to the director, trying to talk to the commissioners who didn't care at all. I mean, apathy was rampant. And um, then we came to the realization that um, you need to have people in power who understand and are compassionate and care and will take action. And so that's when we became pretty political. And in 2012, there was an election. We were kind of late to the dance. Like, we came to this realization right before the 2012 election, uh, maybe a few months before then and started talking to the commissioner candidates that we thought were likely to be new to the commission. We, they looked like they were had a potential to win and talking to them about our, our, our situation. And that's when they want to talk to you because they want that support, they want that vote. And, and you know, a couple of them were honestly uh, inspired and wanted to bring something good to our county. So that was our first little taste of a little bit of success because we formed some relationships with a few people who um, we thought would help us and a couple of them tried. And um, we've had a couple of little steps towards success, but unfortunately we don't have enough support on the Board of Commissioners to um, get anything really good done uh, because we need at least five votes and right now we have three. So every time those three people try to do something, the other five say ha 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 and they undo it. And um, it's just so frustrating, but um, the, great, the great thing and kind of the bad thing too is that there's a, an election every two years. So uh, 2014 is a, another election year and we are smarter and stronger and just so much more aware of what needs to happen now. And so uh, the primary election in August uh, was a huge uh, project and it was um, uh, a lot of work, but it was awesome because um, we focused on getting the word out about educating people about who makes decisions and why it's so important to vote in the primary and who the animal friendly candidates are and we had um, five county commissioner districts where we had identified animal friendly candidates and encouraged people to vote and out of five of them three won their seats um, and i think we definitely played a role in that at least especially in, in one of the districts and one of the ones that we lost, we lost by 40 votes. It was heartbreaking. And that 40 vote loss was in a district where the candidate was endorsed by the UAW, had $12,000 in money to spend, and she was the incumbent. I mean, to come within 40 votes in a situation like that, like I said, heartbreaking, but it just told us we're on the right track here. So um, we're headed into the November election now, and um, we are set up to have, well, we for sure have three strong candidates in there. 
And I want to say that one of them was not necessarily an advocate for us before he would go either way, but we decided to endorse him and we've worked really close with him. And now he's like the biggest advocate that we have. And he's the chairman of the board right now. So, I mean, it's that communication and the work that we've done is really paying dividends. So we've got three. And um, we know that one of the districts um, that it, there's a race in, we're pretty likely to get the, a fourth one. I don't even think we need to work very hard. He's pretty set up very well to win. So we need one more in November. And we have four districts where there's a race. One guy, I guess is, uh, I said, is going to win for sure. One, there's no animal friendly candidate. So we have two districts to focus on. And that's where we're gonna put all of our time and attention. So that's what Grace has been working on. I, I didn't expect the picture here, but <laughs> go ahead. I, I shared these pictures because I wanted to illustrate that there is backlash sometimes. That because what we hear from a lot of voters is, oh, they would they would never retaliate like that. Nobody wants to kill. They would never do that. They do. And so what happened here was um, Grace and their supporters put together a protest outside of the Genesee County Courthouse right prior to the primaries to really get, you know, ramp up the excitement, get people to, to know what's going on and to get out there and vote at the primaries, how important it is if you love animals. And you had, what, 200 at least people show up on a workday weekday outside the courthouse, cars driving by honking at their signs, just an amazing, powerful um, show of support. While that was going on, this was taking place back at the shelter. This is the break room for the volunteers, and it's also where they kept their supplies for the animals, donated supplies. And the staff trashed and destroyed this room in retaliation for the hard work of the volunteers simply trying to gather support to save more lives. So there is that degree of immaturity. It does happen. And when it was brought to the attention of the people in charge, they said a dog did it. Yeah. Um, the dog would eat the treats, not just open the box and move on to the next thing. There were no teeth marks, and somehow they opened jars. And just getting into the room would have been impossible because it's a very large door that's not propped open. I mean, it wasn't a well thought out excuse. So another area of focus for us is anti-chaining, anti-tethering. And if you're not familiar with the group Chained, Inc., oh, they're phenomenal. And they did this on their own, and we just simply backed them up. But I believe they are at 11 communities downriver that have passed ordinance saying you cannot chain your dog 24-7. That's huge. And it's a momentum that we're going to keep on rolling with and going from community to community and introducing an ordinance and asking that they pass it so that residents cannot chain their dogs 24-7. Um, they've been getting headlines. We're very proud of them. They're, they're a phenomenal group. Humane pet acquisition. This is about banning the retail sale of dogs and cats that are imported from puppy mills. It's about supporting shelters and supporting rescues and adoption. So we work with communities and the easiest ones to start with are the ones that don't currently have any pet stores, retail sales. Much easier to pass an ordinance and that prevents them from ever moving in in the future. Passing it in cities where there is already a pet store, little bit more of a challenge, but we'll take it on. And Puppy Mill Awareness of Southeast Michigan leads this charge for us and we support them. They also have a booth out there. If you're not familiar with them, stop by and talk to them. Uh, they do great work. And they have successfully shut down dozens of puppy mill stores in the state of Michigan. Um, they're having an event September, September 20th. I mentioned Novi earlier. Um, it is the pet retail capital for our state. They have the two largest retail stores that import from puppy mills. Um, we have spoken to the mayor of Novi about it and tried to educate him about that and um, they bring in money and business to his city and that's where his priority is. So on September 20th, Puppy Mill Awareness is going to create a 300 human chain in front of the mall wearing signs about not supporting puppy mills and about adoption. So if you can make yourself available on that day, go let them know that you want to be part of the human chain. They're going to give you a sign to wear and a red bandana. And on that day, let's see, um, noon to 1.30, we're going to get everybody's attention and let them know that Novi supports puppy mills. 
And the last one is law enforcement aggression against pets. And this is a fairly new epidemic. Um, it's happened in the past, here and there you'd hear about it, but lately, um, in the past year or so, it is a full-on crisis. And what we found is that law enforcement, for the most part, receives zero training in animals, yet it is part of their responsibility. So we feel that all law enforcement should have some mandatory training regarding animal behavior, animal handling, and that um, we don't need to shoot people's dogs because they're barking. Um, we had a case where um, the police were chasing a suspect and they jumped the fence into somebody's backyard and she had her dog out in her backyard and they just shot it. It wasn't even a pit bull, it was a Weimaraner, so therefore it didn't make the news. Um, Colorado actually passed, um, passed a law mandating that all law enforcement officers receive at least three hours of animal handling training. Three hours is not enough, but it's a start, and it's a step in the right direction, and it gives us a precedent to work with so that we're able to say, this state did it, and here's how they did it, and we can do it too. Um, so this is the case in St. Clair Shores where um, the police got a call that there was a dog barking. So they showed up, and the dog was kind of meandering between its own porch in the neighbor's yard and wasn't attacking anyone, it wasn't going after anyone. And the reason we know the facts of this case is because it was captured on dashboard camera. We have the video camera of the entire events of the day. In the end, the police officer chose to shoot the dog and kill the dog. So that made our local news. And then when the owner filed a federal lawsuit for a million dollars against the city of St. Clair Shores, it made national news. So now, St. Clair Shores had a choice. When this happened, they could have stood up and said, this is an outrage. You will not treat our residents this way, and we're going to do something about it. Instead, they went, oh, well, we trust our officers. And um, that wasn't satisfactory to their residents. Even people who didn't specifically know the case or aren't even that fond of the type of dog got, were motivated. They have children that play in yards. This happened in broad daylight in the middle of the day with people everywhere. It was absolutely and completely unnecessary. So this is a big problem, and it's one that we're going to try to take on. Um, and we're putting a team together now who really wants to focus on it. Uh, we think this is a great solution, what they did out in California. All animal control officers and police officers have to wear a vest cam so that there isn't the back and forth, he said, she said. Because although the car or dash cams will catch a lot, it doesn't necessarily catch anything when they're away from their vehicle. Believe this too? Um, you gotta vote. You have to vote, and you need to drag your neighbors to vote. It is the, one of the only powers we have in this country. It's, it's, our, it's, our most, it's, it's more than money. For every dollar you can donate to a campaign, a vote is 100 times more valuable. And so that is pretty much it for what I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, but I wanted to leave enough time for you guys that have questions or you have specific situations that you want some help with or you just want to know how to handle something. So if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to use the microphone so that everybody can hear you. But does anybody have anything that they want to talk about? Come on up. Or I can repeat what you say. Great question. So. If you are a 501c3, you cannot endorse candidates. That's it. So as a 501c3, and my Pause for Life Rescue um, is a 501c3, I could not say, go on our website and say, vote for so-and-so. That would be violating the IRS rules. However, my volunteers can absolutely become part of my PACA. We're individuals, so even though we volunteer for an animal rescue or a shelter, or even if we're employed by an animal shelter or a rescue, as an individual human and resident and voter, you can do whatever you want. Your organization can't endorse candidates. Your organization can get involved in issues. That's why the Make Michigan Next anti-BSL campaign, that's put together by a coalition of animal rescues, and we're all 501c3, and then it's plus my PACA, which is obviously not a 501c3. Um, we're able to be a part of that because it's an issue. I issues are key to animal rescue, and we can get up there on any pulpit and talk about an issue and the way we feel about it, but we can't endorse a candidate. So that is, that's the only thing you can't do. Does that answer your question? It's a good point. Yes? How do you decide in terms of shelter reform, like what shelters to target? Do you get feedback from people, volunteers or people in a community that's not happy with the 
Yeah, so she's asking about how we choose which shelters to work with on shelter reform. We're invited by a community in most cases. Somebody will call us or send an email and say, we are having a heck of a time getting our public county shelter or our city shelter to do the right thing. They have an opportunity and we just feel like we're gonna miss out on it, can you help us? Then we also, we target the red states. Um, because we can't be everywhere at all times, it's kind of like TNR, you know, TNRing one cat here and there isn't going to have that much of an effect, but if we really target an area and get as many as we possibly can, we'll see a difference there. So targeting is one and then being invited is another. Yeah. Anybody. So um, we've been invited by a member of the community who simply, you know, my dog was lost. I went to the shelter to look for it. They wouldn't let me go down two specific hallways. I didn't find my dog. I went back, I went back, and then sure enough, a volunteer went, Shh, come with me quickly. Took me down those two hallways and there was my dog. How do I make sure that never happens to somebody again? And so they'll invite us and we'll come in and we'll see what we can do. Um, we can be invited by uh, elected officials. That would be great, because it means they're engaged and they're paying attention. Go ahead. Okay, I was afraid this one was going to come up. Uh, what's that? Wayne County's not on there. You're right. And um, Detroit is a special case. There is no community in the entire country facing the issues that Detroit is. We are the first to go bankrupt. Yay for us. Um, and we've seen nonstop corruption in our county government and in the city government over and over. So we are... We were hopeful in the primaries that we would get our candidate for Wayne County Executive through the primaries, and that was Bill Wild. And he didn't, he lost, and uh, we've got an uphill challenge. And this is one area where I, we truly don't have all the answers. All we can do is keep chipping away. Um, we invited all of the Wayne County um, commissioners and executive and all of the city of Detroit officials and animal control to attend this conference free of charge. None of them came. So we have a huge uphill battle, one, in telling them that this is an important issue. We understand Detroit has a myriad of issues right now and that they feel the animals are kind of bottom of the barrel. And until their residents tell them it's not the bottom of the barrel for us, this is important and we want it handled, we're going to stay where we're at. So uh, we're, what we're doing now is collecting voting block members in Detroit and in Wayne County. So we need to get those voting blocks as big and as powerful as possible. Once we hit that, we will go before city council and speak to them during public comment, and we will go before the Wayne County commissioners and speak during public comment. One of the things that we tell our officials, and we mean very much, once we start, we don't stop. Because the second you stop, they feel they've won, and you're yesterday's news and we move on to the next issue. But if you show up at every single meeting and you keep the message going, eventually you're just gonna wear them down. We have kept city council meetings there until midnight with a, just a line of residents during public comment, each one taking their three minutes and making their point about what's important to them. And we tell them at the end and we'll see you next week. That gets old and eventually they go, okay, we gotta do something. We're not getting anything else done. They're keeping us here all night. So even if it's not for the right reason, we're going to make a move. So that's where we're at with Wayne County. It's going to be a huge uphill battle. Um, we need to get out of bankruptcy. Um, we probably need a new, uh, for those who aren't familiar, Harry Ward oversees Detroit Animal Control. Um, we need him to, to not want that job anymore and go do something else. It's um, because at this point it's become a battle of a power battle of who's right and who's wrong and I'm going to win and you're not. That does nothing for the animals and you, you, there isn't much of an out you can give them where they feel like they won. And that's also very important to some politicians. So um, we will never give up on Detroit and Wayne County. We're going to keep at it. Um, there seems to be some movement with Michigan Humane Society possibly taking over Detroit Animal Control. Um, all speculation and rumor but based on the fact that they filled out the DAC's 2013 shelter reports with their own address, we think there's something going on. So, but nobody will confirm it. Um, MHS won't really get involved. Um, they, it's the best I can say is they don't really want to get involved. Now, they do lobby. They have a lobbyist who works in Lansing for specific bills that they want passed, and I'm sure they'll continue to do that. 
but in terms of um, going after city officials in Detroit, they don't seem to be interested. Now, they have formed a coalition with rescues and groups that work in Detroit to try and work together to solve our animal problem in Detroit, like going around Detroit Animal Control. Um, it's brand spanking new. I think they've had maybe one or two meetings, but that's an option. Maybe that will help. Um, it's a tough one, really tough. Who else had a question? He's our best hope. She asked if the new Detroit mayor has any power. Um, Mike Duggan is, has shown some interest in talking to groups, but he just doesn't have time yet. He has other issues he needs to work with first. So we are walking that fine line between being persistent but not harassing him. Um, we're going to continue to ask for a meeting with him until we get it, and we do understand that he's fairly new. There's a lot going on to get his arms around, and so we are trying to walk that fine line and hopefully eventually we'll get a meeting with him. We'll be able to explain that we're not just attacking and saying, you gotta change. We're offering you solutions. We are offering you partnerships and collaborations and things that won't cost the city any money and ways to bring in money to the city. But we need to have that meeting to have that conversation to get that far. So we'll keep, we'll keep banging his door down until, until we get it. Jen? Thank you. So her question is about CAPA, which is Companion Animal Protection Act, and that is the law that was passed in California that says um, shelters cannot kill animals that rescues are willing and able to take. And it's a law in Delaware saying the exact same thing, but going a bit further and saying that shelters cannot kill animals if they have empty cage space. We absolutely want it in Michigan. Um, to answer your question about who is working on it, no one. Um, it's on our agenda to get something like that passed. The, the problem we've run up against and where we have to provide an answer is shelters legitimately have a concern where what's a rescue? If you're gonna pass a law that says I have to hand an animal over to a rescue, somebody's gotta define what a rescue is. And right now in the state of Michigan, there's no definition, there's no regulation, absolutely anyone can raise their hand and say, I'm a rescue. Each individual shelter can come up with its own policy and that's pretty much what they do now. Some will not work with rescues. We don't have the time or the resources to vet all you people, so we're just not going to work with you. Um, shelters like Michigan Humane started their own program where they have qualifications and criteria and an application and you can apply to be a partner and once you're approved, now you can pull from Michigan Humane. So we, we, need, a, we need a state program. We either need the Department of Ag to decide to regulate rescues or register rescues or do something so that we can answer that legitimate question from shelters about if we're gonna require you to hand an animal over, we need to make sure it's going to a safe place. It's a great question and that's exactly what we're, we're gonna find out. So we've got calls in to both and I'm most interested in how Delaware did it because California, they get a lot of stuff done and they take it like extra steps. They're usually always ahead of the curve. Um, but Delaware is a little closer to our situation, a little more closer to the side of the country. So we're asking them, how did you do it? Um, it could be that they just had a legislator that totally believed in this and ran with it and pushed it through and got it done. But how did they start and how did they answer that question? And it could be that they have a program that regulates rescues, that you have to meet certain criteria for the state to be considered a rescue. Some shelters only require a 501c3. Now we've had two cases in this area of Michigan in the last two months where rescues turned out to be not so great. One was more than 100 cats found dead in the home and the other was just raided and all puppies confiscated and animal cruelty charges have been filed. Those were rescues. Rescues involved in the community, not fringe groups. They were known. I myself have worked with them and it's not only very shocking to our community when this happens, 
It's incredibly disappointing and heartbreaking because it not only gives all legitimate rescues a very bad name and reputation, but we then question, well, then who can I work with? I, I've, you know, I, I know these people and I was completely fooled. So, so um, to combat this problem, the Michigan Pet Fund started a, a rescue certification program. And the idea was if we could start this program and we could get all these rescues certified and on board, we can answer their question. So when shelters say, how do I know what a rescue is? You simply work with the certified ones because the certified rescues have been vetted, they've gone through a process, and they have signed a code of ethics, and they agree to operate this way. It's the best we could do. So it's a voluntary program. Because it's voluntary, we need rescues to want to sign up for this. They have to agree to use um, best practices from tra how to transport animals, like you know, you don't tie them to the roof of the car and drive to the adoption event. And unfortunately, I can show you pictures of that. Um, so they agree to abide by a code of ethics and best practices, and that's it. You have to be a 501c3, and you have to agree to a couple of things that seem to be very controversial to some of the rescues in Michigan. And what we found, because we only have 11 or 12 certified rescues after this program having been alive for two years, they don't want to be regulated. They want to be told what to do. And most of them already are doing best practices. They already meet all of the criteria necessary to be certified, but they don't want to be told what to do. And that's how they see it. So it's trying to get them to understand that's not the purpose of this program. We're not policing rescues. This is not about watchdogging. It's actually about agreeing to operate the best that you can so that we can pass CAPA. Yeah, John. I think, um, I think there's one session after this one, and we've got to wrap up, but I don't believe that there's like an all, an all, all of us in the same room at the very, very end. So I will give you my call to action. If you're not registered to vote, go get registered. November, show up at your polls. Check out my PACA if you want to know which candidates in your district or area have proven to be animal friendly. And get involved. If, if jo joining your voting block, simple and easy. Um, but if you want to take a leadership role, if you want to be a city coordinator or you want to be a county captain, um, come talk to us. We would love to have you. We have mentors um, who have been doing this and who will help walk you through it, tell you how they got started and what's worked for them. We will give you business cards. If you choose to be a county captain, we will give you a Facebook group page where you're able to talk to your, your voting block members, your advocates in your community. If you want to join one of our issue teams, you want to be on the BSL team or the TNR team or the law enforcement team, let us know. Those are great ways to get involved because if we learn nothing else from this conference, the power is within us. Whether you're inside a shelter or outside the shelter, you have the power to create change. And because our animals don't vote, we vote for them. But if we're not engaged, they lose too. So. Tell other people about this. Tell your animal-loving family members and friends and neighbors that they need to sign up for their voting block. Ask them if they want to come to a city council meeting with you. The more our elected officials understand that we are very serious, we are not going away, you represent us and we've told you what we want, the more that they'll start to get on board. And I'm very encouraged by the fact I have seen four Oakland County commissioners at this conference this weekend. Um, and I guarantee two years ago, they wouldn't have looked twice at coming to an animal welfare conference. So it works. I'm also encouraged and I am delighted by the fact that this conference was sold out. I truly believe we can do more when we work together and we know each other and we're all just on the same page. So thank you guys. Feel free to come up and get a business card and I'm happy to answer more questions.